and Buju. Tanse. I don't know where I'm going to talk with Bana Quentin Nigo, Miguach Kapija Ek, Oma Gikino Matega Migong, University of Winnipeg, Shinakate, Oma Wiga Migong. So, uh, my name is uh, Wab Kanu, and I work here as the uh, Associate Vice President for Indigenous Affairs. And um, welcome to the University of Winnipeg. I'm, I'm glad that you could all join us today for uh, what is going to be a very interesting and uh, I'm sure uh, challenging in all the right ways sort of lecture. We're very uh, proud to have a uh, distinguished uh, scholar joining us here from uh, Toronto by way of the Métis Nation. So we'll get into that in a second. I do want to invite uh, students and uh, you know faculty, community members who are here to sign up for the Indigenous Affairs uh, mailing list if you haven't done so already. We are using it uh, to keep people informed about uh, events like this on campus, which are of course open to everybody, but uh, we'd love it if uh, students and faculty can come out. And also, um, going into the next academic year, we'll be using that mailing list as a, as a way to contact people around uh, student supports, around making sure that students can uh, access uh, you know, all the uh, additional academic supports or cultural activities that uh, they might want to stay plugged into. So I'd encourage you guys to do that. So the issue of Indigenous health, I think, is uh, one that's of uh, paramount importance to both our country's future, but especially this province's future. Because with such a, a high Indigenous population and so many unique challenges uh, confronting uh, First Nations and Métis and Inuit peoples, um, there is both uh, a tremendous you know, potential challenge to everyone in the public sector, um, but again, I do think that with all the discourse on reconciliation, the good work that's being done on uh, Indigenous health research and on indigenizing the academy generally, there's also some real opportunities to bring about innovative approaches to uh, public policy and to health care that are driven by community needs and that are driven by local knowledge. So it's within that context that I think we're kind of uh, excited to have uh, Dr. Smiley join us here today. And so, um, you know, I don't want to go too much into her bio because I'm sure she'll explain what she's all about, but um, she's a family physician and also a, a health researcher at St. Mike's in Toronto. But if you take a look at the literature that she's uh, published, she's also an extremely, extremely active a uh, member of the academic community and one who's creating a, a very distinguished uh, body of research in uh, what is a very important uh, area. And so we are really, um, I think, uh, humbled and honored that she would uh, choose to join us here today. And, uh, you know, over and above the knowledge that she's going to share with us, I would hope that she is also a, a good role model and a good example for all of our students and uh, grad students here. Uh, about what they might uh, be able to do in their chosen field of studies. So with that, I'll say miigwech uh, pijayan. Thank you for coming here, uh, Dr. Smiley. And ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Janet Smiley. Tanzi nana tuiwan mekwana skweos niten sine kasin. My name is Janet Smiley, um, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, visit this territory. Um, it's really nice to be in Winnipeg. It's not very cold. Um, so just saying, even though I'm from Toronto, I still know that. Um, that's a picture of my mother um, who, um, on the banks of the Saskatchewan River. So I put it up there to remind myself um, to locate myself as a, a Métis woman. Um, and uh, today we're going to talk about racism right before lunch. Um, so one thing I do want to just acknowledge is that this is a real alive um, beast of a problem. Um, and it's been with us, I think, for as long as human beings have been around. Um, so I'm going to speak to an approach that I'm crafting with a team of people, but I really, first of all, just want to acknowledge each and every one of you that's here, 
and all of our ancestors, my ancestors, um, that did all the heavy lifting on this topic and acknowledge that it's real and hurting us still. Um, okay, Let's see if I can figure it out. So we're going to talk a little bit about how people speak about racism. One of the things I think is because of the history, um, the severing, the undermining, um, the marginalizing of Indigenous peoples um, that we live with in this country, the actual language to speak about how we relate to each other, um, naming this word racism and what it means um, can be challenging. So we'll, we'll, we'll start a little bit with some of the language, but I don't want to get carried away, so I want to continue to ground what I say um, in people's experiences, and I'm hoping maybe at the end um, people will feel motivated to challenge um, or add to this little piece of the puzzle that I've been trying to work on. I'll talk a little bit about what we know about the prevalence of racism and its impacts on Indigenous health. One thing that's really interesting is, and probably good, is that in um, Canada there seems to be actually a reluctance to speak about racism. So I was actually speaking with an Indigenous woman who's a leader in Toronto um, working for a major um, health policy and funder, and she was told that she can't actually write the word racism in any of her briefing notes, for example. Um, some of you know, and um, I spoke about it this morning, um, that I had the responsibility to um, be an expert witness in the second part of the inquest into the death of Mr. Brian Sinclair. And that's part of what has motivated this whole area of work for me. Um, as a result of that, I actually got asked to be an expert witness in another inquest um, uh, that was looking into the death of a First Nations woman from the Yukon named Mary Johnny. And actually, I did that because the lawyer representing her mother had asked um, me to help. And one thing that was very interesting is this was after I had been at the inquest of Brian Sinclair. So I guess I was getting known as somebody who perhaps had some knowledge of this topic, which also, again, seems a bit ironic, because, of course, um, many, many people have intimate knowledge of this topic through our unfortunate um, life experiences. Um, but the lawyers and the inquest people in the Yukon said, well, oh, no, we can't have Smiley come be an expert witness, because racism is a very serious accusation. But actually, the accusation was around medical malpractice, and the finding of the inquest was negligent homicide. So I was speaking with a colleague of mine in Toronto, um, Kwame McKenzie, who's an activist and has done a lot of work around um, racism, uh, um, another um, scholar um, looking at racism experienced by people who are racialized as black, and he said, well, you know, that could actually be a good thing. Like, racism is so bad that it's worse to be racist than to like malpractice to the extent that you kill somebody, right? But we've got to talk about it. So part of what I'm trying to do here is figure out a way to engage in this conversation, not re-traumatize people um, and not make things worse. Um, so that'll be the second half of the talk is just some of the ideas and experiences um, and uh, approaches that I've been able to dig up working with others. Okay, so here's a slide that I'll commonly put up um, when I'm teaching, and you, I'm going to come back to it, but just in case, so that it's a little bit um, experiential and people don't fall asleep. Um, look at this deficits versus strengths. And in healthcare, we're not so good at doing this. Some of you are, right? But in education, of course, we've been talking about strength-based approaches for a long time. But in medicine in particular, I think we're pretty deficit-based. I always say I used to get feeling a little sickly by the end of my medical school lecture on Indigenous health and, you know, snuck out of the room, maybe I better check my blood sugar or, like, uh, make sure I'm not, like, too depressed. Or... Um, so name three problems or challenges that you associate with Indigenous people. And now name three strengths or assets. Just take a second and then reflect on the exercise. Okay, so... Um, and the original purpose of that exercise was to... Um, help people perhaps identify that might be 
like a lot easier to come up with three challenges than strengths or assets. But then it's interesting because, of course, both of them are stereotyping exercises. Um, so I would like it if there was three universal assets of Indigenous people um, that I had to, just by the nature of me being Indigenous. But of course, uh, we know um, that that is not the case. So people can unwrap the, the layer. So that's one way that I'll kind of introduce the topic. Um, and then I guess some people will say that like there's still quite a bit of denial. So an exercise like this really is to get at some of the deniers. I think it would be hard, you'd be hard pressed to find like a medical student that could, um, like that doesn't start thinking about diseases or, or deficits. They mustn't have been reading any of the medical literature. Okay, so, and then I'll show slides about visioning indigenous success and of course like what a day it is, right? So I reflect because so one of the things I say, and again, I don't mean to minimize people's experiences, but like in my grandmother's time, so sometimes when I'm speaking, I try to think my grandmother Ruby would be here. Like, what would she think? So here we are in this hall. We got introduced by um, a leader in our community who's like fluent in his language. I can even say a few words in Cree. Um, and um, we're talking about racism, and then we're going to go out for lunch. So. Yeah, she would say, well, it didn't used to be that way. Um, so here's my boys, um, Jay and Quinn, who are seven and a half now, and I'm trying to raise them as um, Cree, Métis, Coast Salish, Irish boys in downtown Toronto. If you have any tips, let me know. Um, but just, again, getting away from this deficit mode. So it's easy, maybe, hopefully some of you here can vision Indigenous success, right? Um, like, uh, and that there's more and more opportunities to see that. But of course, um, when we get out of here and go into our classes, hopefully the scholarship, we're indigenizing the academy. But I would say, um, like when I go to classes in medicine in the School of Public Health, like in my home university at University of Toronto, um, yeah, it's not full of visions of Indigenous success yet. Um, so, and then just a little bit about the context then. So how do we create different contexts? So we have this context here today, this lectureship series, this um, group that you can join if you're students here. Um, I've tried to create a little context again, like uh, this is a little nest in a Catholic hospital called St. Michael's Hospital. Um, so we tried to make this action research center. Um, I love working on visions with Indigenous community partners because they're very long term, right? Um, so the vision that every Indigenous infant will be born into a context that promotes health and well-being. That can be a message that perhaps can motivate change, I think, and policy change. I think particularly within healthcare contexts, we have a little bit of leverage. I think um, overall, many people in Canada are invested in equity in our healthcare system and would think, so people get quite upset. They might be denying it, um, but they get quite upset at the concept that perhaps it isn't fair and we don't have equal access to health care, and unfair decision making is happening. So here is just an example, and again, I'm not sure if this has happened in any of the hospitals here in Winnipeg, um, but what happened with our research center, and because really, when I'm out in community doing research, it's kind of like I've changed to a used encyclopedia salesperson, so I'm a bit more popular maybe when I'm being a family doctor, which is why I remember, try to remember my grandma here, you know, what am I doing today that would actually be useful? Um, so here's Jan Longboat um, and um, uh, to her, um, if you're looking at that, I'm a bit dyslexic, that's why I'm not a surgeon. If you look to her left, you'll see that um, guy with the gray curly hair. That's my boss's boss's boss, not that I'm aware of hierarchies at all. Um, Dr. Art Slutsky. Um, and uh, basically what we have is this council of indigenous grandparents that kind of co-governs the research that we do at Well Living House. So actually I actually have to report, so if you don't like what I do today, call them up, they'll uh, hit me with a little bit of willow um, and try to knock me off my little soapbox or help me. Um, so there's a model and then here's this um, paper that we had the opportunity to write. So, and that was kind of good timing. So actually what had happened, the Wellesley Institute is kind of um, a social think tank um, 
and uh, they had um, supported a discussion paper looking at racism of health and health more generally, but they'd actually um, excluded Indigenous people. So you get into that kind of funny situation where, um, okay, we know Indigenous people are different, so we won't include them in the racism paper, right? But then there's nothing at all, right? Um, but again, and thanks a lot to all this hard work at the grassroots, it was around the time of Idle No More. So then I'm sitting in my office at the hospital, um, and then people would knock on the door, right? And so they'd listen to Idle No More, and they said, you know, well, we realized that it wasn't right to just do nothing about Indigenous people, so can you help us? Um, so then, and then um, Dr. Billy Allen, who's this amazing uh, scholar and academic, um, helped me with that heavy lifting um, on this paper, and we were able to work on this paper. Who would have thought that racism against Indigenous people is national news, right? So that was like the irony in 2015, February 2015, it's national news, right? Like, uh, so. I say that my day job is really just taking common sense things and kind of putting them out there maybe in a different way um, that some weird group of academics or like other Canadians hear them. But anyways, um, so and then it's a big piece of paper too, which is also interesting because um, there's details in there and I'm not, um, one of the things we're trying to do and one of my aunties challenged me to do if we're saying the word colonization Right? Like, don't just put like that bad box of colonization. It's painful, right? But talk exactly what are you talking about? Like, what arm of colonization? Like, what impact, past or present or continuous, right? So it's almost like if we want to um, get rid of that um, illness, right? Like, pull out the foreign body. <laughs> Right? We have to actually understand where it is and all the different arms of it, right? Um, so being specific about it. So we tried to do that when we wrote the paper. The other thing that we tried to do, and Dan Longboat said, and many of you are doing this now um, in the media and the academy, is to tell our own stories, right? So it per like, wouldn't it be ironic, like the story on racism as told by non-Indigenous people in a racist way? So um, yeah, that's why there's those little text boxes as well, and unfortunately, still, if you look at the literature, we're probably hitting par, right? Um, in terms of writing around racism, where indigenous people are actually penning the experience and the response. But I would still say, in the overall health science literature, yeah, indigenous scholars are by far the minority. Okay, so and then we can define racism, um, and um, again, um, I don't want to insult people's intelligence. Um, I like this definition, um, partly because it's an indigenous definition, um, avoidable and unfair actions. So in a minute, I'm going to switch gears and I'm speaking about like implicit or unconscious race bias. I'm, we had some good discussions this morning. I might throw the word unintentional out the window because it's not specific, but when people are racist, but they're actually unconscious, they would disagree that what they're doing is racist. Um, so you can have a bias, and I'll speak about that in a minute. That doesn't mean that you act on it. So what's important about this definition, I think, is it's speaking about an action. And then the other part is it assumes that there is structured social inequities. So it assumes that there's unequal distribution of health and social resources, that there are advantaged groups and disadvantaged groups. And um, we can, if you don't agree with it, feel free to raise a question after. But one of the reasons why I like that is it means that you can't be reverse racist. You can be discriminatory. And I think, um, I think I'm both, um, I have internalized racism. Um, I think I can be laterally violent. I think I can be discriminatory, right? But um, if I was to say something that was discriminatory um, against um, someone, one of my white settler relatives, um, and I have, um, my dad is a white fourth generation Irish settler, um, that would not be racist against my dad. That would be discriminatory. So. Um, that's handy for some of you that get called reverse racist, as I do on a regular basis. You can say, not by my definition, if it's another <laughs> academic. Um, okay, so and then systemic racism, and again, 
Um, one thing that's interesting is people seem to be very much okay talking about systemic racism, but not attitudinal racism. So you'll see the College of Family Physicians is going to come out with a statement on systemic racism. And when we were working on that, it was interesting because um, like attitudinal racism, they're just like, oh, okay, but because we're all doctors and we have a professional code, no one's attitudinally racist, right? And so we rewrote that a little bit, right? It's kind of like, well, actually, if there was an attitudinal racism, then you wouldn't have systemic racism because people would have insights so that those two things are kind of connected. But clearly, um, the Indian Act is an example of systemic racism. Um, you'll see, um, and again, when I'm speaking about um, to like mixed audiences, people often don't know, like they're really shocked to hear that there's formulas by which we're considered. So like, you know, my son's like uh, Indian status is defined like in numbers and that Indian Affairs actually has like little formulas like 61 plus 61 equals 61 and some of you are nodding and maybe does anybody not know that in this room? Okay, because in Toronto I would say if I was talking to a mixed academic audience, um, yeah, there would be at least half the people that wouldn't know that, right? Um, or that the Indian Act still exists. Um, so, sir, it's tough in Winnipeg. It's cold, there's wind tunnels, um, and uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna say that there's more of that R word than anywhere else, but uh, people know their Indian Act here, yeah. Okay. Um, but then again, and I, I thought I had a slide in here because another, so we have an example of systemic racism, our federal government, Indian, um, Indigenous and Northern Affairs has been found um, to be guilty of racism, systemic racism, discrimination against First Nations children living on reserves. So there's another example. Okay, um, so Lisa Bolven gives me permission to use these images. And again, if you um, like uh, email her, she may share them. She's this amazing um, Dene artist, um, second generation residential school survivor, um, who's kind of reweaving her connections um, with her family across disrupted kin lines as many of us are or have. Um, and uh, just doing these beautiful images, self-taught, no training. Um, so. Anyways, um, she is, this is a picture of her grandmother. So, um, uh, and I, again, I apologize because it's quite a disturbing and hurtful image, but um, just to start trying to explain some of these experiences um, in images as well, um, as we talk about words. So attitudinal or interpersonal racism, right? So the um, colonizing, rationale, right? Um, the civilizing mission, right? So Europeans didn't think it was okay just to come and take everything, right? But they had this civilizing mission, right? So they had attitudinal racism. They decided that their lifestyle was better than the lifestyle, the diverse lifestyles of indigenous peoples here, right? Um, so that kind of attitudinal or interpersonal racism, and it still weaves into everything um, that is imposed on Indigenous people because like what people don't realize is what we learn at universities, right? The problem with universities, and again, um, here I'm gonna quote my um, very wise Métis midwife, little sister in Toronto, Shirley Bourgeois, um, who says the problem with universities is they teach us that we know better, right? We know better, I get to be up here now, right? Like, uh, so it's a joke. Um, because we don't know better. I don't know better. I don't know better as a family doctor. I don't know better the 24 seven of lived experience and what we hear over and over again, but we forget is the answers lie in our communities, right? So, but if the civilizing mission was that we know better, then it's really, really dangerous. Um, so yeah, I guess um, some smart academics can figure out a way to still have a job um, teaching people that they don't know better. Um, I'm not sure uh, who that'll be. Um, but uh, yeah, it's part of indigenizing the academy, of course, and that's a huge tension, right? The way academy is set up, I talked to you about how I know who my boss's boss's boss is, but the fact then that I get invited here instead of any one of you here, youth or elders, um, who would have just as much um, probably more like relevant knowledge, um, but I get up here because of some little badges that I got from a colonizing system. Um, 
So Charlotte Redding has done some really good work here too, and there's a set of fact sheets from the National Collaborating Centre from uh, Aboriginal Health that are uh, worth having a look at. So, and then showing images like this just to try to explain to people then, um, and this is a much overused cartoon. Somebody's gonna email me soon and start charging me royalties on it. Um, Dr. Raven Sinclair was the first person that shared this slide. It's a political cartoon. It's actually based on um, a successful land claim by a First Nations in BC, so the first time that oral history actually got admitted into a court of law and recognized as valid. Of course, that person that's sitting there looking like an Indigenous person, the artist couldn't really render the sophistication of their knowledge system. Um, but if it was a little colder, I could look out the window and say, like, so there's no good or bad knowledge. Well, there's good or bad scholarship, but um, I guess what I say is what kind of knowledge is most relevant for the issues that we're dealing with, right? So, like, if my plane was to crash on the way back to Ontario, somewhere in northern Manitoba or Ontario, what would I prefer, right, to have, like, Google or, on, or the Cochrane collaboration on my um, handheld or to have one or two knowledge keepers who knew how to keep me alive on the land. Um, so when we're dealing with Indigenous health and in Indigenous communities, it's that arrogance, it's that we know better, right? That is actually extremely frustrating, which actually um, is resulting um, in preventable like illness and death and suffering, um, but it's actually a bit funny. Like, why would anybody think by sitting in a university, like for several years, they would know better than people that have been living in our communities? Um, so just in terms of racism, so other stuff that can be helpful, um, and some of you might know this literature, and there's just this unique Canadian syndrome then where we don't acknowledge um, racism in Canada, we don't have it. Except um, like uh, the common misunderstanding is racism is something that happens like in a bar brawl, right? Like, uh, but, um, or um, like by a bad comedian, right? Um, or some politicians. Um, but in fact, um, it's been discussed within the healthcare system in the States for quite a long time. So um, 15 years ago, in fact, the Institute of Medicine, and again, depending on who you're talking to, because a lot of times what people will do is they'll marginalize the discussion. So I've just critiqued academia and academic validation of knowledge, but at the same time, it can be a handy tool um, in case you're having a discussion with somebody who still invests a lot in it. Um, so this Institute of Medicine, who's heard of the Institute of Medicine here? Okay, so it's like just this handy thing you could have in your back pocket, right? Like if um, somebody's saying, oh, I'm not racist, there's no racism, like you're just being oversensitive, right? Um, so in fact, the Institute of Medicine is a leading health policy body in the US. So if you speak to people in public health and you say oh, it was an Institute of Medicine, thing, they would say, oh, okay, phew, I just thought that was like some lived experience reference. Um, and uh, what they actually did is realized that there was unequal treatment happening in the US and that people who were racialized as black or Hispanic actually um, were having poor health outcomes um, and they controlled for poverty and where you lived. So, wow, that's weird, I wonder why that would be. And they found that it happened study after study and across different areas of illness. Um, and then again, we know that there has been um, some documentation. We don't ask, we don't like to talk about racism, but there has been, we've been asking about it and scholars here and um, communities have been asking about it in Manitoba. So we have Jamie Sidra over here. She's just showed that racism impacts access to dental health care here in, for First Nations people living in Manitoba. We've shown that racism is alive and well in um, urban Indigenous communities um, in Ontario. Um, so that um, about 50% of people who self-identify as First Nations, for example, in the city of Hamilton will report that they have experienced racism and they felt that it's impacted their access to healthcare. Not news to many of you here in the audience, um, but again, like I said, my day job is just seeing things that people already knew, but putting them out in forms that 
um, we can broaden the audience. Um, and again, the Health Council of Canada has done some excellent work, and I know there's people in this room that have been involved with that. And then, of course, the negative health impacts of racism have been well documented. And um, we drill down on some of that references, like in the first people, second class treatment, or you can look at Charlotte Lopez, Charlotte Lopez documents or, or follow up with me. And then, of course, Annette Brown, a leader in this area, a great ally, um, looking at people um, accessing the emergency room. So, and what we can talk about in health care is there's places that are kind of high risk places, like danger zones, like uh, so emergency rooms are definitely one of them, right? And she looked at people accessing the emergency room in downtown. Um, Vancouver, um, and she looked at Indigenous and non-Indigenous patients, and all of them were um, getting discriminatory treatment um, for those that were involved in using substances, but there was something specific about what was happening to the Aboriginal people. And again, this is where it's um, hard to put voice to. Right? So if it was like you're walking in and there's a big sign, you know, saying loud mouth, Métis, people not welcome here, um, speaking about myself, um, so, um, or um, then you could deal with it, right? Or if somebody said a racist comment right to my face, then I can deal with it. But here it's like they have an attitude. I don't know, right? Maybe it's because I'm Native. And then when we test them, we find out that actually they do have stereotype negative associations with Aboriginal people. So we're not making it up, okay? And here we, we're not making it up, right? So the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal just showed this. Now, some people think I'm a little bit generous. I think that some of this is um, intentional, um, for sure. But I actually think that most health and social service providers don't wake up in the morning and say, yeah, I want to discriminate against Indigenous people today. I'm going to make sure that I um, refer them less for life-saving procedures, right? Or in um, Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, yeah, I'm going to get those First Nations kids living on reserve and make sure that I save all the money like for the non-Indigenous kids. Um, so I guess um, even in the report from the tribunal, like it shows intent, right? But it also says that a large amount, the majority of racism happens in an unconscious or unintentional way. So the little piece of the puzzle I'm trying to figure out here is how we can engage people in conversation and move us beyond the stigma and the denial and actually work with the goodwill. Okay, there's also going to have to be policies that are going to be addressing um, some of the um, recalcitrant minority. Okay, so we have this um, international and domestic evidence that Indigenous people are less likely to get these life-saving interventions. And again, I'm using um, references to big medical issues, so heart, heart disease is a, is a big deal. It's a big deal for everybody, but of course it's a big deal um, for um, middle-aged white men who hold a lot of power and privilege still in society. Um, but uh, here we find out, even here in Canada, finally, because we've known this in Australia and New Zealand for about 10 years at least, um, that if you're a First Nations person living in Alberta, you're less likely then to get um, good imaging of your heart within 24 hours of having a heart attack and then more likely to die. And that was a study that took into account poverty and where you live. So why would that be? Okay, so here's the hypothesis, right? Um, this unintentional, so maybe we should say unconscious, right? Implicit racist assumptions and then the linked behaviors are the most common and most harmful life-threatening in the health service setting, okay? I don't know this, this is just a, a theory. Um, but I know it's one that we're not really talking about. Okay, so here we go, naming three strengths or deficits, right? But see, if all we get in the media is these negative images of Indigenous people, or most often, I have an associated hypothesis that says it's impossible to grow up or be educated in Canada and not have negative assumptions linked to Indigenous people. I would say that for myself as well, as a, a Métis woman. Okay, so this is where um, some of the new science tools, well, new or old, it just happens that this implicit association testing has developed, been developed at Harvard. So it's always handy to say the thing was developed at Harvard. There's some 
people around here that went to Harvard, right? Um, but uh, I guess uh, I don't think everything is good from Harvard, but um, again, for those people that care about such things, um, they may have a stereotype that it is. Um, so basically, it's like a little logic test. It tests faulty logic. So it gets you to sort things, okay? So it gets you to sort people by racial identity, body size. Um, the reason why um, this um, person's face is like very delineated is because they don't want to distract you by like what color shirt or hat this person might be wearing or even we can't really necessarily tell what their gender is. Maybe you can see that. I would probably um, like uh, do a male gender identity if I was pushed, but I uh, should be careful about such things. Um, so basically you can see though, black people, white people, good or bad. And how it tricks you, it's hard to cheat on it, right? Because you start sorting people by how you racialize them. And then they teach you to sort other words like good, bad, like joy, hatred. Um, and then they get you to sort two things at the same time. And it turns out that our brains are pretty powerful things, but when we have to sort two different things, we do it slower than we sort two same things. And that really, really smart people can trick this, but it's hard to do. So basically it ends up showing you that um, if you're sorting faster all the time, white people with good things, um, that you have a race bias preference. Um, and then what they do is they actually um, give you a little norm. So they'll say Janet, Smiley, like uh, you can do it for body size as well. Like you prefer like uh, thin people to large people and you're like uh, somewhere on the 60th percentile or something like that. In fact, I think I was pretty normal, like uh, mid-range. I didn't have that much explicit association. So you can go to harvard.ca, like put in implicit association in Harvard and you can test it out. The one that they have on Native American people is really strange though. It's about if they're domestic or not and I can't get my head around it because it's too clear to me that indigenous people are tied to land. So I wouldn't do that one. I think it's got a theoretical faulty uh, starting point. Okay, so here, the negative images and stereotyping of Aboriginal people, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, but it still can be surprisingly bad. So the story I tell with this slide, which is one that went across the country um, following um, the uh, fracking um, disputes in New Brunswick, and of course they show this, but they don't show the community elders being treated disrespectfully by the police. But actually this was a file slide on a CBC news report in the morning around dental health. So my auntie, I was at a meeting with my auntie and she came down furious to breakfast. I'm like, ah, good morning, auntie. And she's like, um, they showed, like they were showing cross-cultural dental health. And so I guess they had stereotype slides for all the different racial groups of people, but like for the uh, South Asian people, maybe it was like a stereotype slide of some like positive cultural event. Um, but for the indigenous kids, they showed this as their file slide, right? And it just shows, like CBC is usually a pretty good ally, right? But here, so somebody, nobody, that person didn't wake up in the morning, I don't think, saying, oh, I'm going to like perpetuate negative stereotypes of Aboriginal people. They were just like stretched for a slide and they weren't self-reflective, right? So of course, here's the story of Mr. Sinclair, and again, um, I don't want to minimize that story. I always want to honor um, Mr. Sinclair and his family. Um, so um, I hope that, um, so like, uh, we don't really know what everybody was thinking, right? What were they thinking, right? Like, how do you walk by someone who's dying, like, for 34 hours? But to me, um, there was a lot of debate about this. So I think that there must have been some unconscious and conscious racism at play, right? So we won't say intention because that's too hurtful, like, because that could minimize it. But clearly there was some faulty logic, right? Like clearly I would like to think nobody got up and said, oh, I'm going to my shift and I'm going to ignore like somebody with a treatable urinary tract infection until they die of sepsis, right? So. I would like to think the healthcare providers there and the staff like got up motivated to help people. So why did that happen? So there's a lot of complicated scenarios, but it's not just flow of people through the emergency room. There's something wrong with people's logic. We stereotype 
in the emergency room, right? Like that's how we make diagnoses, right? So that's good. It's life-saving to stereotype sometimes when you're trying to figure out. We memorize protocols about how people might be, um, what might be wrong with their heart, right? Because, but the thing is, um, when we people's lives are too complicated, right? So we have to actually um, turn off the stereotyping section of our brain like, uh, and actually challenge it um, when we're trying to address our race preference biases. Okay, so let's just spend a couple minutes. I think I have about 10 more minutes um, talking about addressing racism. So here's a nice slide of people marching as part of the Truth and Reconciliation just before the uh, release of the uh, summary report last June in Ottawa. Something that I tell people in public health, like uh, so um, is um, I encourage them to spend eight hours and actually read the report and then remember the, the seven calls to action. And there's some overlap here because actually um, what I'm talking about, like trying to integrate implicit association testing and um, work on strategies to support people to understand what kinds of unconscious biases they might be having, and that might be um, impacting their decision making, um, is all aligned with the TRC. Um, and then one thing is people say, well, this TRC, this is a big agenda. So I say, well, keep them in mind though, because if you have things in mind, you can create a policy window. So actually, um, an anonymous donor, like who's, um, uh, um, yeah, I guess it's an anonymous donor, but probably I can't give it away if I said that he was also, I racialize him as a white man, um, gave a million dollars, right, to St. Michael's Hospital, and half a million is so that we can actually study the base, best ways of supporting healthcare providers to build better relationships with Indigenous people, right? So to me, that makes me feel okay, right? Like someone's giving half a million dollars so I can actually study my colleagues who are willing to be studied. So we can actually, I can like support us all identifying that, how racist we are and then try to break that habit. Um, so um, of course the answers lie in our communities um, and uh, the idea about self-determination and that's why I keep qualifying this as one piece of the puzzle. You guys hold other pieces in here right, because that'll be your process of self-determination and how you'll address this issue and other issues in ways that you find real and valuable. So I'm a bit hung up on this, like, uh, unconscious race bias, but it's certainly not the end-all and be-all. Um, I'm going to skip some slides here. This is a complicated slide, um, but actually it just says the same thing, the answers lie in our communities. Um, we got it published in Social Science and Medicine, so that's good. My colleagues at U of T can't tell me I'm not a social scientist anymore. Um, but uh, basically what it says is that in Indigenous infant toddler health promotion, if um, participants in an Indigenous health program feel that the program is part of them, an extension of them and their family in the community, the program is more likely to be successful. So who thinks that's a surprise? Nobody. But we did like reviewed like uh, 7,000 like abstracts and like systematically went through these articles in a way that the people that peer reviewed it thought was credible and so now they agree too. So if someone's saying, oh, well that community-based stuff's all good and fine but it doesn't really work as well as my like weird mad scientist like externally imposed idea, you can say, oh, well, I don't, I think there's some evidence that might say you better like check out your weird mad scientist externally imposed idea with what the community thinks. Um, and then here is a picture of the birth center in Toronto. So who's heard of the Toronto birth center? Okay. So, and again, just an example then of something that's community owned and directed. So indigenous people taking charge, because that's really the first step. Um, so this is a birth center that's open to everybody in Toronto. Um, it has over 100 um, midwives signed up and uh, delivering babies. They've delivered over 500 babies, so they've maxed out. And you walk in the door and there's a tree branch with ribbons, right? And the midwives had this idea of tying ribbons in the tree every time a baby is born. They derive that from 
some of the ribbons that my auntie uses in ceremony, right? So, and then there's this Indigenous artwork, and it's governed by an Indigenous community board, but it's open to everybody, right? So not only are we trying to just achieve equity in health, we actually have these models are, that are successful, like that could make the health system better for everybody. Just more pictures of my family. It's good to show your family in talks. My first talk at St. Mike's, they said that, um, actually I didn't know how to give a good scientific talk and I showed too many pictures of my family, but it's locating. I shouldn't rush by them. So that's my, my grandmother, Ruby, and that's Mavis. That was on the um, shore of the Saskatchewan River. Okay, and here's Lisa Bovan on cultural safety. So here's another image. So we hear these terms, cultural safety, cultural sensitivity. Um, and uh, cultural competency, but the idea that cultural safety is actually defined by clients. So the way that we operationalize it in our work is asking people about a health or social service encounter where they felt comfortable, respected, and able to be themselves. Um, and I just wanna show you, this is the um, piece that really changed things for me. Um, so I, I spoke about it a little bit on the radio this morning. But I used to give up then, like so, because we talked about it, we have evidence that there's this unconscious race preference bias. But I thought, well, this is set by time we're age six, right? It might just get worse as we read the media or like get our horrible, like wrong, incorrect history about indigenous people, which I think some of you are fixing here. Um, but in fact, first year psychology students, um, with a two hour intervention. So they did a race preference implicit association test, found out that they had race preference bias. I guess it was a whole class that was white identified, only at a New England school. Um, and uh, then they um, were given a little adult education session about these habit breaking interventions. Um, and again, it's funny because like, perspective taking, like I like the way psychologists like make up these fancy words. So like walking in someone else's shoes right, or individuating, getting to know a person. The stereotype replacement, right, so catching myself when I'm making up stereotypes and then forcing myself to change them. Um, so by th three months out, after that two-hour intervention, they had two phone calls. Little coach, how's it going? How's your habit breaking happening? Easier than quitting cigarette smoking for sure, right? So they actually showed that they had reduced race preference bias at three months out. And even, and they did external testing too to say, do you think racism's bad? And some of them said, yeah. And some of them said, doesn't matter, right? It got better regardless of how important they thought it was to address racism. So that's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm gonna try to do in my experiments with my colleagues um, at St. Mike's is try to figure out, can we use this kind of intervention, this kind of tool with all the hard work that people have been doing in other places, like in, the province of BC where they've trained thousands of healthcare providers. Um, so one thing you could think about is what of those strategies could you pick up and use? Um, and then again, self-reflexive questions, right? And hopefully you know this stuff already, but who are the indigenous people who currently reside and historically resided in your place of living and work? You'll see some of these questions in that College of Family Physicians guide. Um, so I'm thinking at University of Winnipeg, people know this. Maybe this should be mandatory information for people. I know in Toronto, there's some great people out of the Friendship Center that have a history tour now. You can rent a bus and find out about all the indigenous peoples and places and landmarks in Toronto. Where do you get your information from, right? Where do you get your information from about indigenous people? How do you know that's evidence-based? Um, so this is, I think, my last slide, and I have six minutes left. Um, but this seems to be um, something that's interesting as well and that I continue to reflect on. I do this all the time, underestimating, underutilizing Indigenous community knowledge and skills, because we've talked about the challenges in terms of negative stereotypes. If all you're seeing is negative stereotypes, and we've seen, like, what about the generosity of spirit, right? Um, so I think that we had a good example of flipping things around, right? So people's hearts are reaching out to the community of Lalash. They're tired now of the media, right? And asking for privacy. So I've been 
hesitate to bring it up, except to say as an example, right? So people see that as a real tragic and deficit-based situation. It is tragic and there is grief, right? But what about the generosity of spirit in that community? Like who's talking about that, right? Um, so that's a classic underestimate of skills. It happens in healthcare all the time, over and over again. Like people will come up to me and say, oh, I've got this great idea that's going to fix this Indigenous health issue in this community. Can you just like introduce me to that community, right? And I'm kind of like, well, did you ever think about what's going on in that community? There's already a whole system in that community. Um, underestimating time and investment. So, oh, I did that half day workshop. Now I'm all good, like for my Indigenous cultural competency. Um, a colleague of mine in Sioux Lookout did a study with family docs, um, and uh, he found that they were all doctors that were non-Indigenous that had come from outside the community. On average, after reflection, they said it took them two years before they actually even really started to understand what their patients, their clients were saying to them. So that's, like, I like to use that in research, right? So it's like we're talking years here, um, underestimating the complexity of Indigenous knowledge systems and protocols, and then underestimating the importance of health context. That is pretty well um, all I wanted to share, some food for thought and some approaches that um, I've been working on in uh, racism, some pictures of my uh, family. Um, I wonder if uh, anybody had any questions or comments, if we maybe could take one or two. Marcia's got a question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, I know a lot of our focus when it comes to racism in the healthcare system is on provider interventions, which are generally educational, generally voluntary. Given our limitations in health measurement for Indigenous peoples, what type of system accountabilities do you think we would need to build to actually know and also as an intervention of itself for addressing institutional and attitudinal racism in healthcare? Yeah, good question. So BC, yeah, okay. So just like um, most of the time, so most of the time, like if, um, say this university said, you know, we wanna make sure all faculty like are like um, culturally um, able to contribute to a culturally secure learning environment um, so you have to take Wab Canoe's like cultural safety course 101, um, like uh, and so. But actually, there would probably be. I think it's probably unionized here, right? So like, if I said no, I'm not taking that. I don't agree with that. Like, uh, like so, whether or not it's mandatory, right? Um, and then how do we actually know if it's working or not? Because the worst situation is when someone takes the class and then they actually think they're better and they're not better. Okay, so BC, it's mandatory in BC, okay? Um, and then, but they still like have to, so there's the issue of just whether you can make it mandatory. So I think that in the end, we might wanna think about it. People have actually said to me at first, I thought this was a weird question. If we were working on developing an indigenous race preference IAT, like should that be mandatory to get into medical school? Like the MCAT, right? Or, and then again, I'm kind of generous on some days, especially when I've been well fed. Um, so it's kind of like, well, maybe it's not as important what the initial score is, it's how people respond to the score, right? Um, now, so the assessment as well, that's why I like this implicit association test, because it's actually a measure, though it's a measure of bias, it doesn't mean that you're translating it into your behavior. Um, but other strategies that you can actually do to measure, so you can have like secret patients, like secret shoppers to go and see an SS, and I think we're standardized patients already, and I found out all these people I knew in Toronto were like standardized patients to train the medical students, so there's no reason that we couldn't send in people to actually um, assess in that way. So those are exactly the questions that I'm thinking about. And then even, I agree, I think it's weak. That's why I mentioned the way that we're interviewing patients and saying, but how, like cultural safety, what does that mean? Like I got a parking ticket or something? Like those words are all, like even that word, how does it translate? So it's the way we're operationalizing and interviewing people is to say, you know, um, like did you feel like you could be yourself, like respected and comfortable in this encounter? So interviews 
So um, I think that um, I'm motivated by David Williams, like uh, this Harvard professor, man of color, who was talking about racism. He said 10 years ago at the American Public Health Association, and they said, you can't measure it, right? And now he's developed this whole literature. So I think we can measure it, and I think we can work together in partnership with communities to figure out safe ways of investigating and assessing it. Um, but it's going to take some policy will, for sure. Thanks, Marcia, for the question. All right, well, how about one more time for Dr. Janet Smiley, and thank you so much for joining us. And uh, to share uh, a few words in closing and to respond, I guess, on behalf of the University of Winnipeg, I'm going to invite up uh, Dr. Annette Trimby, who is the, uh, the President and uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, U Winnipeg. So thank you students, uh, faculty, uh, Leslie from our Indigenous Advisory Circle, Dr. Janet Smiley for coming here today. Uh, it uh, makes me think about um, some of my time when I worked for Alberta Health and Wellness. And one of the things that struck me when I worked there was um, when people think of health, they think of it in a very negative way and they think of the healthcare system, but we know that the determinants of health are largely about what happens outside of the healthcare system. All that being said, um, your talk today did remind me that I have two brothers, both with heart problems. I'm from a Métis family. One brother is brown, brown eyes, gray hair, wild looking. Other brother is blonde, blue eye. And they both experience the healthcare system in, in a very dramatically different way. So um, I know um, we should be talking about data and not anecdotal evidence here, Jim. I'm looking at our chair of psychology, but uh, my end was two, two polar experiences. I think what gives me hope is people don't want to be biased. And I think they just need some tools to understand their biases. And I, I think the notion of habit breaking, life should be about constantly evaluating and understanding your habits and trying to figure out which habits you want to discard and which habits you want to take on. So you mentioned Winnipeg being kind of a special place. It's cold, it's interesting, it's changed a lot in the 30 years since I left it. I think it's a much friendlier place. I'm very happy with a lot of the things we're doing at the University of Winnipeg to combat racism. And one of the things we're very proud of is our students asked us to mandate some Indigenous content. So every student who graduates from the University of Winnipeg three or four year degree has to at least take one three course credit in uh, something with substantive Indigenous content. It's mandatory, but it came from the students and we took time to work with the community and we have ambassadors everywhere, so we're quite proud of that. We're also very seriously con committed to doing our part, following through on the TRC report. And we are an educational institution, and we are going to look for opportunities to encourage our faculty, our students, our staff, as well as our larger community, have access to some of the history that we all need to know to better understand why we have these unconscious biases. So I just want to thank you for coming here. I look forward to further conversations. And uh, I'm just very proud to be the University of Winnipeg's president today. Um, everybody has a boss. I figure out I have about 10,000 of them. So uh, you know, you talked about your boss's 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 boss. But just turn that pyramid upside down. So anyways, thank you very much.